Good morning from California. Finally, I am back. I am joined with um, Bill Patton for visual training for tennis. We are going to be talking about kind of, I mean, it's not a new concept, Bill, but it's, it's a different concept that maybe not everybody is familiar with. And certainly, I'm sure some of our viewers have heard of Billie Jean King's Eye Coach and it's kind of along those same lines, though not exactly the same thing. But before I let you roll with talking about visual training for tennis, I want to just let people know that if you have questions or comments, you can just type them in the little comments um, on the Facebook stream and I'll see them and can ask Bill as your questions or comments come in. So, Bill, first of all, thanks for joining us. It's early for us. Well, not really, but I'm still kind of adjusting from East Coast time. West. I, anyway, it's crazy. Um, but thanks for joining us and glad to have you back. It's been a while. Thank you. It's great to see your face again. And, um, yeah, I guess it's really cool that you're here in California. And then, yeah, to your comment, uh, I would love it if people had a question, especially if I can clarify some things. Because, sure. Because – there's a this is going to be a pretty dense conversation with pack jam packed with info and i hope a lot of value but if i wouldn't want there to be a lack of clarity so yeah feel free to ask a question at any time and um you know i'll stop i'll stop mid-sentence if that's what you want but anyway okay. yeah i'm i'm excited to talk to you and share with your listeners and uh you know if if one person is out there helped being able to see the ball better then it's definitely worth the time for sure. Yeah. So I, I want to also just mention you've got a new book coming out on visual training for tennis. And so I want to make sure that we give a plug for your book. And Thank you. Well, actually, it's a course because the okay. book has been out for a bit. So, so the book is called Visual Training for Tennis. And now uh, with the help of Brent Abel from Web Tennis, uh, he's mentoring me through this period of time. Uh, I've created a two and a half hour course on visual training for tennis. And so I'd like to call it comprehensive, uh, but the, the field of visual, visual training and the understanding of how vision and your brain interact is so vast that um, I'm going to call it two and a half hours of maybe <laughs> as much as you can Start. handle. Yeah. As much okay. as you can handle and as much as might be useful now. So perfect. Yeah. Well, so any of us who play tennis who are, or who have sat courtside while our child has a lesson have heard the phrase, keep your eye on the ball. Pretty much any sport that involves a ball, right? Keep yeah. your eye on the ball is kind of the common directive from coaches. So, right. There you go. So, can you talk to us about? what that means and why that might not be an accurate directive to use, especially for players who are just beginning in the sport or who may be trying to level up in the sport. Yeah. And one, one thing I'm going to do a lot is name drop. So I, you know, because, uh, because you know, go ahead. We're, well, we're all standing on the feet of giants, right? On the shoulders of giants. So, you know, I like to reference back, where did I get this stuff? Because I would hate for someone to think that somehow I'm the progenitor of all this stuff, right? So Ken DeHart is pretty famous for putting a ball on his eye because he's keeping his eye on the ball. So showing that the words don't make sense. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no reality to that. You don't keep your eye on the ball. Now it, maybe there's another way to say it. And so our language needs to match up with what we're actually trying to say. Sure. Um, one, of the, one of the laws of, of success, according to Napoleon Hill, is the law of accurate thought. So when we can accurately convey our thoughts and put them into a context that is very learnable and as, is actually connected to reality, then, then we're teaching reality instead of just something that we heard by tradition, right? Um, well, and, and our I, brains yeah. have, have a predisposition, right, to trigger with certain words. So keep your eye on the ball. You know, we may intellectually understand what you as the coach are trying to tell us, but 
you know, our brain may not hear it that way, may hear it more literally and then shut down. That's a great point. And so it's not specific enough. And then the same thing with watch the ball. It's that watching is not really a specific skill. And you referenced um, the eye coach. Yeah. And that's a great reference because uh, because Lenny Schloss and the people at Billie Jean King's eye coach do a tremendous job of teaching in this field. And so so in reality, what we ought to be teaching are actual visual skills. So one skill is scanning. And so and then another skill is tracking and then there's focusing and people fo tr attempt to focus for way too long. Mm -hmm. But so that's another thing that you'll hear people say, focus, focus, focus. And then what they're doing is they're creating um, this, this always on mentality. But if you watch any good player, they obviously shut down in between points. Right. And this part of well, the ritual is the, is the shutting down of, of so-called focus and actually, mm -hmm relaxed concentration is probably a much better description of how you want to be. Well, and it's that whole thing of, you know, yelling at somebody to relax and, <laughs> you know, the, the response that causes is the complete opposite of relaxing, yes. right? Yes. It's, it's a stress inducing um, phrase. And so kind of the same thing with focus and focus can mean visual focus, but it can also mean, uh, mental focus and, you know, honing in on the moment so, and using absolutely. mindfulness and all of that. Well, and, and so the, the main issue that I, that, that seems to be, we're confronted with here is that if you use nonspecific language, you force the student to figure it out on their own. Mm -hmm. And some do, many don't. Right. Many don't figure it out. So the, the main issue uh, for me is that there are two real breakdowns in, in visual skill training. And that the first one is for beginners. So because beginners aren't immediately taught how to really see the ball well, then they get frustrated and they quit very quickly. Right. Right. And, then, and then for, the, for high performance, I mean, as you go up the levels, each new level has a different visual demand. And there seems to be this asteroid field between 4.0 and 4.5, mm. where, you know, once, once you start getting into the 4.5 range, the ball's coming a lot faster and with a much wider variety of spins. And then that... And it only... always comes back. It always comes back. That was and my so... biggest um challenge when i moved from 40 to 45 things that were winners at 40 you know i would hit a ball and think okay the points over four okay, five no, it comes back. no, <laughs> this is, no I, if, if this whole talk goes like this we're, we got a winner on our hands because that's a great <laughs> great no that's a great great um thing for people to latch on to because the that then the new visual demand is how do you stay mentally with it so that you can see the ball yeah right because i mean i've i've seen this a lot of times especially with um even you know really top juniors you know they they hit what they thought was the winner they mentally checked out you know they're ready to clap for themselves and then the <laughs> other kid goes and gets a racket on it and it's like startled back to reality yeah. i can't believe they got it back and now you have that now you have an inability to really see the ball. And then I don't know how many times I've seen an error on the next shot by the person who thought they had, we were going to be hitting a winner. Well, and you are playing catch up the rest of the point. Once you've checked out because you think you've hit the winner. Now you have to bring yourself back in a split second to that point and continue working the point. Right. And it's as you said, likely. a lot of times, right, well, and right. And <laughs> so what happens is you produce the error, you lose the point, and then you're kicking yourself because you're like, well, of course, I'm at a level where the other person on the on the court with me is going to get the ball back. They're just as fast as I am. They're just as skilled as I am. Yeah. And, and that and we do see that a lot in the juniors. And and I do I want to keep this conversation focused around the juniors because yep. guarantee cases. Um but, you know, I think it's it's one of those lessons that our kids 
learn um, oftentimes on the job training because as they continue to level up in the game, they learn the hard way a lot of times that that next level, it's not just that the strokes are prettier or that the other person is constructing points better. It's that more balls are coming back. Uh, yeah, again, a great point. And so, you know, this partially explains why people who don't have the prettiest game are able to win a ton of matches, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I was not the most fluid or beautiful basketball player in my life. And, and people really were frustrated about my ability to make shots from very weird positions and off balance and all that. And part of that was, was, you know, a visual thing as well. So, uh, you know, so that it's, it's kind of gratifying to be that person who can win matches, even though um, your game doesn't pass the, the ice skating beauty competition. Well, it's the whole Brad Gilbert thing, right? Winning ugly. So it doesn't really yeah. matter if it's pretty or ugly. If you get the yeah. W, you get the W. But no, yeah, now, visual skills are huge. Anyway, go but on. But for juniors and who are on that developmental pathway, um, winning ugly isn't really what we want them to do. We want them to continue to develop proper technique, proper movement, and Absolutely. yes, proper visual training so that as they move up through the age groups and get to the place where they're going through college recruiting or they're considering turning pro, that their games are positioned for success at that level, right? Well, yes, and absolutely visual skills will facilitate better technique. And, uh, you know, it was Lenny Schloss who shared that eight out of 10 mishits are caused by poor vision of the ball. So, and so let's, let's dig into that. What does that yeah. mean? What does visual training mean? Yeah. Well, you know, first I wanted to tell a story about a okay. tournament experience that I had because, because it's, it's more than just a performance thing. You could actually be saving somebody's tennis life, so to speak. All right. So that sounds um, so dramatic. <laughs> Well, it kind of is. And, no, you know, I, I mean, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I don't think it's, I don't think this is overly dramatic because when you hear the story, you're going to know why, why I said that. Right. So um, I, I used to run a lot of tournaments, uh, you know, I've run like 10 or 12 tournaments a year and um, uh, you know, I've seen thousands of junior matches, you know, in my life and all that. So, uh, so anyways, so I'm watching this kid play, you know, I'm keeping an eye on everything and he's making some bad calls. Right. And, um, and then I'm looking at his dad and his dad's, you know, um, from the Balkans, right. And he's, you know, gruff and he's, you know, very, you know, he's a macho guy. Right. And a little intimidating, I have to say, I mean, his, his physical presence is very masculine man. Right. Right. So anyway, so I'm watching, I'm watching all this and the kid makes a bad call and I kind of see the dad kind of wince because he saw his kid, make a bad call and then so i'm watching the kid and i'm like he's not doing the normal i'm a cheater behaviors you know because here one thing that cheaters do is after they make a bad call they they go like this they go they turn into a robot that must avoid contact with all spectators yeah you've seen that a million times right so right. there are a lot of there's this milieu of be, of behaviors that the cheater does right and so this kid had no guile and i'm like what's going on here and so he made eight eight mistakes in the match and the other kid maybe intimidated by the dad didn't say a peep and i'm kind of i'm i'm looking at over at the other kid like come on kid ask for a lights person right but you can't tell him that right but i'm available <laughs> so yeah. so anyways i'm watching this match to completion and we get done and the kid shakes hands and wins the match and he's made eight mistakes on calls. So I'm like, this is very curious, right? So I'm like, hey, sir, after this match, can I have a little chat with you and your family, right? And he's, he's you know, perplexed as what I'm, what I'm going to talk to him about, right? So anyway, we get together. And your role is tournament match. director at this point, right? I'm tournament director. Okay. Yes. Just, okay. just clarifying. Sure. Yeah. Yes. No, it's important. It's an important yeah. distinction because yeah. as an official... Yeah. If I was a USDA official at that time, I there's no way I would have this conversation. Okay. Right. Got it. Because uh, that's it's sort of, it's out of bounds that way for sure. Mm -hmm. So 
So they come off the court and I'm like, you know, sir, I was watching you watch your son and your kid just seems like a really nice guy. You must be a terrific dad, you know, and I saw your body language when he made a couple of, of mistakes out there. You know, I it seemed to bother you and I appreciate that. <laughs> and now do me a favor. Can you go take your son to go to the eye doctor? <laughs> <laughs> because because I've I've from watching him, I don't think he's a cheater. I just don't think he's seeing the ball well enough to call it out. But now but now what's the normal way of doing things is to ignore that. Go into denial. Mm -hmm. up, there's a kid who makes bad calls. He's a cheater. He'll be he'll be labeled a cheater. Uh, he he will not make friends easily mm -hmm. when the word gets out that he's a cheater. So he's just a kid that can't see that well. So anyway, so a couple months later, I'm with my juniors at an at an event, and the dad comes running up to me very fast, and I'm kind of bracing for action because I don't know if I've offended him. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. He's coming up to me so fast. I'm like, am I under attack here? And he comes up and he says, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh -huh. We went to the doctor, we got his eyes checked. Now he wears glasses and he wears contacts when he plays and he's playing better. And so, but the, I mean, that's a binary thing. That's a this way or that way. I mean, yeah. so not only was he gonna be a better player because he got his vision figured out earlier rather than later, but now also he doesn't have to go through this stigma in life right. of being a kid who makes bad calls. So, so that's, that I think really is the the iconic story of why we really want to take vision so seriously. Um, it's not just for a performance thing, but but you know, um, it's not necessarily really obvious that you need to get your eyes checked, but everyone probably should. Well, I was going to say that's really step one in all of this is to make sure that you can see properly. So, you know, if your kid is having issues, and I'm going to turn my lamp on because I just realized I'm really dark. Well, and here, here, I'm going to put my, a little bit. Gla I'm gonna yeah. my glasses on for a second because I, it's funny because I was having a very strange experience where I was driving home late at night and I was seeing things and I thought my, I have some kind of macular degeneration or or a torn retina, and I go into the eye doctor extremely worried, and he says, oh, no, you just need glasses. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And that that's a lot of times that's all it is. So yeah. I think, you know, the first step in this whole concept of visual training is to make sure that your child can see. And if they can't, let's get them some vision correction yeah. right off the bat. That's a generic, you know, they, they're going to need it for school. They're going to need it for life. Yeah, so, yeah. Let's well, take care then, of that. Yeah. But then but then once we make sure that they are seeing properly, then we get into more specifics of the actual visual training for yes. tennis. So so assuming that they have 2020 vision, whether naturally or with correction, then what happens? How do we start this process of training them to see the ball better? Yes, excellent. Um now um do you have that article in front of you? Because I, I, I think I sent it to you. I gotta, I, I, maybe, I maybe need to pull that up. But anyway, uh, really, it all starts with, with especially a coach. I mean, so I would say parents, you know, uh, go to your coach and ask them what do they know about visual training. Mm. Um, so you can, you. This is a one of those decisions that you make about who's going to coach your kid because if they understand a lot about how to do this then then it's easier for people to do that now there are obviously notable exceptions because there are some genius coaches who have almost zero idea about this but because of this um savant nature that they have they have an ability to get things out of the kids so I mean, I think of Robert Landsdorf as being an example of that. He's he's so amazing, but I don't even think he knows what he does. Yeah. So, but anyway. Well, and I think but, that's yeah. that's a common situation in tennis yeah. because um, it's not like you have to go through formal training to become a tennis coach and learn A, B, C, D. You know, some people do, but a lot of coaches don't do that. And some of them, like you said, just innately 
understand the sport so well and are such good teachers that all of these different facets and components of the game come through in their teaching, including how to see the ball. Yes. And so, so visual training for tennis brings together as many practical things as possible. So um, one of the problems with the, this area is that people have shunned it because the, the people who presented it were a little too much in the ether. They were it's a little too woo woo and and seemingly yeah. overly demanding that you get an you know a master's degree in this stuff. So anyway, so where does it begin? It begins with anxiety because anxiety changes your perception. So here's a here's a really good analogy. You know, you you started a, your project at nine o'clock at night on Sunday night, and it was due at eight o'clock in the morning on Monday morning, right? Mm -hmm. So you get your papers out and, you, and your books and you put them down. And before you know it, it's 937. And so you go, you go, wh where did 37 minutes go? But it wasn't, time didn't change. Your mm -hmm. perception of time changed because your anxiety level was up. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, so the minute hand starts looking like the second hand. Right. So, but, and that's the experience that a many, many players have when they go onto the court. They're anxious, right? Um, and there are things that coaches do that make students more anxious. And there are so, things that parents do. And there are things that parents do anxious. that make their kids more anxious. So, yeah. if, so for parents, for parents, a great learning environment is low anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. To start, to start. And then great coaches sort of slowly increase the amount of anxiety because there comes a time where if you're preparing somebody to win the 18s nationals tournament and, and they're going to be, you know, a couple thousand people watching on match point, you better be prepared for that moment. Right. That's a nerve wracking experience with so many eyeballs on you, right. but you can slowly ratchet it up and the day to day training experience, it ought to be very low key. So, um, so yeah, I mean, if you're a parent and you're causing your student to be more anxious, um, and hopefully your kids talk back to you and then let you know, Hey, mom stop it right mm -hmm. um, you know sh right so uh there was an interesting thing um the the mom was cooking dinner and or breakfast and the dad was helping out and and the son the 13 year old son comes in and says hey mom don't burn that bacon yeah you know hey dad make sure you r run the blender you know for a full minute right and right. Then the mom says don't you think we know how to cook breakfast Right. And the son says, yeah, well, now you know how I feel when I'm about to go to my match. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so now. But so all of this yeah. anxiety, again, getting back to the visual training, because I want to, I want to stay focused here. Yeah. Um, anxiety on the part of the player can definitely impact how they are seeing the ball. And so let's talk about some specific things, Bill, that, players can do to kind of override that anxiety, that adrenaline rush, whatever it is, and really make sure that once they set foot on the match court, they are mentally, physically, and otherwise prepared to see the ball the best they can and to perform the best they can. That's great. So, I mean, one of the most timeless concepts of all time is you play like you practice. So your mental preparation to go into practice ought to resemble your mental preparation to go to play. So, you know, you, so take time, take time to stop and think about, okay, what do I want to accomplish at tennis today? Right. Okay. First, I want to warm up my eyes. Right. And then I'm going to warm up the rest of my body. And, then and what does that mean? Warm up my eyes. 
Well, uh, let me get through the rest and then okay. so because because you want to establish these routines that then you're going to use when you play a match because if you only do it when you play a match, then it's not practiced enough. It's not routine enough. So, all right. Um, so you can warm up your eyes uh, physically and and also skillfully. So you can you can you can do some eye circles. You can go side to side. Um, here's an exercise to strengthen your eyes and also warm them up. Put your finger six inches in front of your face. Focus until you get to where you can see your fingerprint. Then look at the far fence on the opposite side until you can make out the cyclone fence pattern or the, the fabric of the windscreen, right? Or the court number, whatever it, whatever it needs to be. And shift your focus back and forth. Because now your ability to track and focus on the ball is going to be improved. Mm. Um, one thing that I do at the beginning of every lesson with every player at every level is we start by tossing a few balls back and forth nice and easy to set the tone of relaxation. This is something I learned from Ken DeHart. Um, so just playing so, catch. Yeah, just, yeah, toss the ball back and forth. I mean, you know, to just get yourself tracking the ball while it's going very slowly. And then you don't have some really small rallies. Let your eyes get acclimated to the moving object. Mm. Because a lot of times what people do is they go straight to the baseline and they hit the ball as hard as they can. And, and then you're going to get one shot rally, two shot rally, one, one, three, one, one, two, one, one. And, and so then you're basically you're setting yourself up for frustration um, at that point. So, you know, starting with a little ball tossing, having a little really choked up rally from a couple feet from the net, then going into a little short court. And as soon as I say short court, then a lot of coaches and parents, the alarm bells go off in their mind. I will never do that. Right. I will never, ever, ever do short court. Well, OK, fine. But you're missing out on an opportunity to warm up your eyes now. Short court can be done poorly. And if you look at any teenager, just about any teenager is capable of doing short court very poorly. Because the assumption is, this is so easy, I don't have to try. Mm. But when I'm training my juniors, I'm like, no, no, no. Short court is an opportunity for you to get your racket perfectly centered in your racket and train that that sort of almost perfection of you know tracking the ball when it's not coming very challenging so that you're using extremely precise footwork to track that ball into the into the ideal part of your racket um, which varies depending on what level you are that's a side topic but um so so use short court as a way to be extremely precise and it will pay off for you. But otherwise, yeah, it's a waste of time if you're just lollygagging out there. So mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, go further back in the court and have some easier rallies before you move back. Somebody made an interesting observation the other day about how when pros practice, they give the, each other a lot of really nice balls to hit. Yeah for a pretty lengthy period of time and yeah. then you know the challenge level goes up and they might actually play a practice set where they're trying to beat each other's brains in right but um so yeah warming your eyes up is a part is part physical and it's part the skill and we can get into more about the specifics of the skills yeah let's do that all right um now before we get into the specifics of the skills, we have to realize that there are actually two very important ways that people differ in their vision. Um, visual researchers say that if people are different as different as their fingerprints, mm -hmm. that visual ability and visual experience is the way that people differ the most wrap your brain around that for a okay. second. Okay. All right. So now so now that informs us to say, well, okay, Lisa doesn't see like Bill, right? Bill doesn't see like listener. 
Okay. So, so you watching out there, you see differently than me. So now what we need to do is discover how we best see. And so, you know, once we get done with this talk, you're going to have some tools to work with. All right. So the first thing is that about half of tennis players that I've seen are pure dextral and the other half are cross dextral. And I don't think we teach pure dextral people very well. But now, what is that? Okay, wait, yeah. I was going to okay, say, I'm going yeah, to explain. I'm going to explain okay. terms now. All right. Good. Cross dextral is when your left eye dominant, the screen's backwards, by the way, I'm flipped. Yeah. So left eye dominant and right handed, or right eye dominant and left handed. Okay. That's cross dextral. And how okay. do you determine which eye is is dominant? Though? Let me finish I mean, my thing and then we'll go to eye dominant. Okay. 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 All right. So that's next. So that's that's a really good question. Um, so then there's pure dextral, which is right eye dominant and right handed, left eye dominant, left handed, right? And they seem to have my experience, my own little workshop, you know, uh, my my own laboratory with no real scientific data seems to say that, that there's some specific skills to each one. All right, now, um, eye dominance can easily be tested this way. Take your hands, wait, let me get back, let me get back far from here. Just take your hands and make a very small hole between your hands out in front of you. Okay. And then sight an object, with, and with both eyes open, don't, no cheating, right? With both eyes open, sight something in the distance. A tennis ball is perfect, right? And then close one eye. And if you still see the ball, then the eye that you're looking through is your dominant eye. Now, just to check that, open your eyes again and close the other eye. And if you don't see it, then that's your non-dominant eye. Okay. What if you can't um, wake up both sides? <laughs> What's that? What if you can't just close one eye on both sides? Like I could. No, I there are people. No, that's a good question. No, 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 this is this is all the important stuff. Yeah, I mean, you might have to cover your eye. Some people are not capable yeah. of blinking one eye. Yeah, it's right. that's a fascinating thing. So you might have to cover your eye or have someone cover your eye. I don't know. Right. Because okay. you, you're both your hands are occupied yeah, yeah, yeah. Right there. Okay. So. <laughs> No, yeah, it's important because like, I mean, oh, no. yeah. yeah, I don't think I'm I, so that poor I'm person thinking. out there that's incapable of blinking one eye, and then then they're like, oh, I can't do it. I'm, yeah. I'm doomed. All right, so um, so then you can test your eye dominance, and eighty percent of your seeing comes through your dominant eye. Okay. The do the non dominant eye, you know, fills in depth perception and you know some details like colors and and other stuff so but you do most of your seeing through your dominant eye all right now um so why that's important will come at the end of this section when we get into focusing all right so now the first skill is scanning um and scanning can be understood this way um if we go back to you know hunter gatherers you know and the saber-toothed tiger did i don't know did we at the same time the saber-toothed tiger i don't know but anyway so you come out into a clearing and across the way in the forest, you hear a sound, right? Right, and so then you look, you scan the entire area because you wanna see if there's some kind of dangerous animal coming your way. Okay. Right? So, so scanning is when you take a full field view. Okay. And this is something people don't do often enough, right? So when, you, when, you're, when the ball's getting to your opponent, you take a full field view of the other side. And what that'll help you do is also detect cues in your opponent. Like for me, part of, I, I always had a, co I had a coach who was like, Bill, you don't move forward enough when the other guy's moving back, right? I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm trying the hardest I can, right? He's like, no, 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 you, you really have to detect cues in your opponent better. So when I learned to watch my opponent I mean, that's, you can't focus on your opponent. They're too large. So we do that so, in the scan. So you do full field. And then I started to be able to see, oh, as soon as I see my opponent's back, I'm coming in. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so you start, so then, then 
where you're going to you're scanning for the ball coming out of the racket. Okay. So, so you're looking at this whole field and you'll see the ball coming out of the racket and your brain gathers a tremendous amount of information that would take, you know, 10,000 words to analyze, right? Because based on the cue of the, the body language of the player, their balance, what type, what was the shape of their swing? How cleanly did it come out of the racket? There's so much that your brain can figure out about what's coming. Mm -hmm. All right. So scanning is sort of taking the full field view, but then you also want to attend to the ball coming out of the racket. Okay. All right. And then I, you know, I don't have the foggiest as to when the transitions between these things happen. And I got to believe that it's different for everybody. And some people do them better than others. Um, so well, the other a lot of people, though, this is just it just happens. It's instinctual, right? You look across and you see the full field. And then once that ball starts coming towards you, your focus goes toward the object that's coming at you. And but you're saying there's a way to work on that and improve it and improve the transition time so that we're analyzing better. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, no, I think, I think the, the difference is the intentionality. I'm, I intend to scan. I think people accidentally learn that because they weren't taught it. Okay. We're losing, we're losing a lot of people because we don't teach scanning and people learn it accidentally. They learn it because they have to, they learned it on their own. Their coach didn't teach them. Okay. And so I'm going to say that the default is that pretty close to 0% of my new students know how to scan. And um, when I get someone who's a fairly accomplished player, I would say 10% of them understand scanning the way I'd like them to. Okay. And it can be a revelation to their game. So people might not realize that they're not actually paying attention to the ball coming out of the racket. Mm. Um, I mean, I, and I played pretty well. I was, I was, a, you know, four or five for a while, but then three full years of five Oh until I hurt myself. But um, when I was, if I was having, having a trouble volleying on any particular day with some balls coming pretty quick, the, my first cure was, am I seeing the ball coming out of their strings? It's really amazing what can happen. All right, now Vic Braden uh, proved that once the ball comes out of the racket by two feet, your brain passively has analyzed with 95% accuracy where it's going to land. But that's facilitated by that scanning. If you're not paying attention to that contact point, you're not getting the 95%. You're getting a much lower percentage of that. So now, now what are the factors that make up for the 5%? It could be the quality of the tennis ball. It could be the heat of the court. It could be the heaviness of the conditions, wind, blah, blah, blah. You know, that makes, that accounts for the 95% that you can't accurately predict mm. necessarily, especially the wind, right? So anyway, so now at some point, before or after that ball has traveled two feet, tracking begins, right? And tracking is not focusing. Focusing is something that happens. Now, take your thumb and put it out uh, full length from your face. And focusing occurs within that three-degree band of your vision. Okay. So it's a non-mobile. You're, you're focusing so, on something well, that's... Yeah, well, so uh, it can be moving. You can focus on a moving object, oh, but okay. you have to keep it within the three, three degrees of that. Okay. Everything outside of that is your peripheral vision. Got it. Which is probably news for a lot of people. All right, now, so the way I teach tracking is this. I will hold a ball up stationary, and I'll have people look at the ball... Then I'll move the ball, but they have to continue looking there. And then I'll throw a ball across their vision. And that's tracking. Okay. 
keeping the focus on that one spot, even though there's a moving object crossing it's the path. Just a way, it's a way to introduce it. It's okay. I'm, I'm not, what I'm not saying is keep your eyes fixed in one spot always. That would be ridiculous, right? So that's a good clarification, but tracking. Now, here's another interesting thing. I think very few people understand how powerful your brain is at tracking the blur, reconciling that blur into your racket. Well, so, okay, but let me ask you a question because for me, my definition of tracking would be holding my finger and then following it with my eyes. That's tracking to me. That's focusing. Okay. Yes, you're focusing on a moving object. Okay. And there is a little bit of confusion. I think some there is a little bit of word salad that comes in here, but don't get you can call it whatever you want as long as you're reconciling the blur. I mean, you can call it a Caesar salad. I don't care. But Well, except you know, that if you're yeah. trying to teach me and right. my definition is different from your definition, then there's some confusion there. So that's why I was trying to clarify. But, so for me, what my if you go to the eye sense. doctor, yeah. they're asking you to track with your eyes. They're, the, the eye doctor stands in front of you and moves his finger or her finger and asks you to use your eyes to track the movement. But you're saying that's focus. Okay, maybe I need to dig and and Sorry. find a different word. No, it's a good point. I mean, because the, the your comments are fantastic. Because ultimately, we want to clear up any confusion that might arise. So, um, bottom line is about allowing your brain to reconcile the blur as it crosses your vision. Okay. Right. So. Um, I mean, does any professional tennis player ever see the ball as anything less than a blur? <laughs> I don't think so. But you know what? It's interesting because several years ago, and I, I time is a blur right now and all of this crazy stuff that's going on in the world. But several years ago, I started noticing Novak Djokovic as he was waiting to receive serve he would be in the ready position with his racket up and all of a sudden his eyes would go like this. I have a theory giant. about that. And I, I mean, to me, it plays into what we're talking about, right? He's I, I think that's something else. So, okay. But let's, since we're on that, let's talk about that. But then we have to get back to the other stuff. All right. So Djokovic had a habit of blinking at the wrong time. This is my pet theory. Okay. So I believe... He, he would blink at the wrong time, and then he would miss returns. Interesting. So this is his, that's his don't, don't blink, blink <laughs> reminder. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, and watch when he does that. He will do that on game point, break point. I mean, if it's a really big point, then he's doing that for sure, because okay. he, he understands the, the gravity of the situation. So right. that's my pet theory on that. Okay. Um, Okay, so so the brain has an amazing ability to reconcile the blur and allow you to see it going into your strings. Now, we know for sure that you cannot see the moment that the ball is in your racket. It happens too fast. It's mm -hmm. faster than the eye can detect. But you can see it come in and out. Mm -hmm. You can see the blur approach and the blur leave. All right, now, uh, the third thing is focusing because... Because you do focus, but some people are going to focus differently. So um, now, w fully one third of the time that you have to see the ball is after it is bounced. Because the ball slows down because of air pressure. Once it hits the ground, it slows it down a lot more. Then it continues slowing down. And, and you've got one third of the time after the bounce. So the time to focus is from the bounce into your racket. Okay. Now, um, I took something that was research from golf and I applied it to tennis and it seems to work and I've never seen it not work, but that doesn't mean it's scientifically proven. Okay. okay? So cross dextral people seem to be more, seem to have an easier time playing tennis because they're better suited to focusing on the ball from the bounce 
into the strings a la Federer. If I could do screen sharing, I would show you this image. In fact, if you want this image, email me and I'll show you Federer, you know, eyes perfectly on contact, right? The, the iconic be like Federer thing. So, but, so wait, hang on one second. Let me just clarify this. So you're saying cross dextral people, meaning their dominant eye is the opposite side from their dominant hand. Correct. So I, I'm a lefty, but I'm a pretend like I'm a righty for this. So I'm hitting a forehand here, but my left eye is the one that's seeing the ball. So really you have more space than if you were trying to focus with the same eye as your hand. You have more I would call it field angle. of vision. But your field of vision is a little bit wider too, right? Or am I? Yes and no. That? Yes and no. I, I kind of want to push past that one. Okay. Um, we can come back to that later if there's time. But yeah. Um, I think I think the issue is more the angle than, okay. than anything else. So, but you know, interesting thought. Um, so now, cross de pure dextral people though seem to be better suited to focusing at a place halfway between the bounce of the ball and their racket and then tracking the ball the remaining distance into their frame and i've just, and so here's an interesting thing i mean you know they would show people would show well keep your eye perfectly on the ball like federer you know green circle and then they would show another player eyes ahead of the ball red with a slash don't do this but then those people that they're showing are grand slam champions mm. and i'm like it can't be all bad yeah so anyway I, so guess guess who looks ahead of contact serena williams and she's not shabby yeah right, right. so um so i have th these great images where i've drawn a, a, a line from where their eyes are looking to where the ball is and what their potential contact point would be. Mm -hmm. And clearly Fed is locked right into contact and clearly um, Serena is looking ahead of contact and has nothing to do with men and women that I can tell. Okay. So it's not, it's, it's not, there's no other factor other than what type of C vision do you have? But there's no, you know, I don't, I don't see anything affecting that. Um, okay. We got a question, Bill. It's an interesting one. So I want to throw it out at you. What if you have a child that does fine motor skills, left-handed and gross motor skills, right-handed. So oh, this is, we think yeah, of this is Maria good. Sharapova, we think of Rafael Nadal, right. Who play tennis with their non-dominant hand, but certainly it's their dominant hand on the tennis court. Yeah. Short answer. Figure it out. Um, <laughs> Oh, that's so, not okay, no, th that's my short answer is figure it out. But uh, now let me dig into that though a little bit. All right, so I had this girl that I was coaching, and for a long time I assumed that she was right-handed because she'd always been playing right-handed and she was doing fine. But you know, I, I realized I'd been remiss in not in not testing this particular group of kids. So we did the the vision test and found out her the dominant eyes and I was like okay well let's just let's let's figure out hand dominance now so we got her hitting some left-handed shots and then all of a sudden we discover that she's gross motor left-handed so there's gross motor handedness and there's mm -hmm. fine motor handedness now what's more important for tennis is the gross motor okay so the best way to test is to have them throw because catching is a fine motor skill, throwing is a gross motor skill, and you and generally speaking, you want to the strength is the gross motor because because that's what you need to really make the ball go. Mm -hmm. um, it's it gets really complicated. It's and so this is a great this this is a perfect question because it shows the incredible complication of the whole thing. So. Uh, so anyway, so as it turned out, we decided together with the, you know, the girl and the parent and myself that we would continue to train her right handed because because she'd already developed the habits and the musculature and the everything to play right handed. And it wasn't a good time in her development to all of a sudden take, you know, create a train wreck. Mm -hmm. So 
So be wise in how you do that. So for the listener, how old is the child? Yeah, we don't know. Uh, Alicia, if you're still on, if you want to tell us how old your kid is. Because so I would say if they're under 12 and they don't have a ton of competitive experience, then I would say make, make sure you set them on the right track immediately. 14. 14. And it, but if they're 14 and they're playing national tournaments and they're, you know, then, you know, ride the horse that took you to the dance. Right. So, um, I, you know, it's, it's too, it's, I don't know. I don't want to say it's too late, but it will create a tremendous disruption to try to play with the other hand. And then you get stories like Rafa, where it was like, there was an intentionality to Mm -hmm. play left-handed. But then I don't know if Rafa's left hand dominant, left hand gross motor and right hand. Um, I you know I can't I can't tell you I, I got to get Uncle Tony to talk to me. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, I mean it, it gets really complicated when you have gross and fine. And some people say, oh, both of my eyes are dominant eyes. I'm like, no, they're not. Right. So one of them is going to be the one that sees that sees out and, and identifies things. So that, that is true. Um, so yeah, it's a great question. Now back to the, back to the cross dextral versus pure dextral, mm-hmm. you know, I've, and I've we're down to this... our last 10 minutes or so. Bill, so okay. Just... No, that's all right. That's all right. That so, um, so I've taken this out on the road and done, been a guest coach at, with clinics at, different people's clubs and it's been really amazing things. So uh, this is where I've discovered that about 50% are one and 50 are the other. So now as, as what you want to do is you have to discover if you're, if you're pure dextral or cross dextral, because you want to try both techniques. I'm not even going to say finitely that if you're pure dextral, that focusing into your racket won't work. I, I'm not comfortable saying that, but I am saying a large percentage of people have found that to be a revelation. So when I was in Atlanta, I had a woman come to me and she says uh, very quietly, you know, right before the clinic comes up, hey, I know this is a visual thing, but, you know, I have no depth perception. Right. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. I mean, it's five <laughs> minutes before the clinic. I no. I, there's no way for me to know what that means. Right. And I can't, we can't resolve it in six minutes before the 10 o'clock clinic. Right. So I'm like, okay, well, let's work with it. So turns out she's pure dextral, never knew it. It was affecting her, her depth perception was an issue because she was trying to focus on the ball much more when she should have been majoring more in tracking the ball. Mm-hmm. And it and it resolved her issue, and she was seeing the ball a ton better. And I mean, she was overcome with joy. So there's a there is some really fun stuff that comes out of this. But I think we don't, you know, about fifty percent of the population are not taught this. And I don't think too many people are taught to focus from the bounce into the racket. Um, and fewer still are taught to focus at a place between the bounce into the racket as the ball sort of crosses your vision that way. So what do we do about that? I mean, if we're, if we have a junior player who's trying to level up, whether, you know, it means they're moving up an age group or they're trying to play the next level of, you know, junior tournaments or whatever, and they want to find that missing piece to their training, that's going to allow them to, be competitive at that next level. It seems to me understanding this vision thing and this visual thing could be that that differentiator, right? It could be the thing that's holding them back from being competitive at that next level. And you know, it's almost heartbreaking to me that it takes maybe five minutes to teach this. And it can be a total revelation to a player. And that, so, and so the course that I've created is two and a half hours long. I mean, we've just barely cracked the surface on this stuff. So, you know, there are 30 videos in the, 
in the thing. And so some things will apply to people and be a revelation. And you try to tell your friend that, hey, I'm pure dextral. You should see it like this. And they look at you like you're from Mars. Yeah. Right. But and then other people, you are going to have a revelation in a different area. And then there no one's going to understand them because so it's a wide there's a wide range of skills and ideas and things to teach. And, you know, I guarantee you, I guarantee anybody out there, if you take this course, um, you're going to really be glad you did. Because especially if you're a highly competitive junior or a parent of a junior, you're going to want your, your child to be able to see the ball incredibly well. Reading and reacting to the ball is enormous. And then as a coach, if you're a coach listening to this, you'll make yourself more valuable. You'll retain more students. Um, you're, you, you will have more people go beyond 4.5 at your club. So Vic Braden said this too, also famously, um, if there are no four fives at your club, it's your fault. So, I mean, it, I think it's really important because your eyes are your most important body part. So is there more we can dig into before we get going here? Well, like what I was, minutes, huh? yeah. So what I was going to say is in the course itself, you give specific exercises and drills that people can do. I mean, I want them to understand if they, if they're going to, let's, let's to finish. Yeah. Let's finish on this. Let me, let's, let's get really practical for a second. All right. Okay. So, so there are, uh, there's a great book. A lot of people know the inner game of tennis, but fewer people know inner tennis playing the game, which is the second book. And it's far more practical. So, most of these ideas come from this, but but not all. So so number one would be this thing where you're focusing on your finger and looking out because you can you can learn to shift your vision very quickly, very mm -hmm. fast along with the ball. And that can facilitate focusing better. Your eyes will be stronger. All right. So now so, sometimes you meet players who seem like they're incapable of hitting topspin and you, and vice versa players who seem incapable of hitting flat. Now, one of the things that solves that is if the player, the, I think people perceiving the ball as being higher or lower than it is. Mm. So the player that can't hit top spin think the ball is lower than it is. Okay. No, they think it's higher other than way. it is. Yeah, so it's gotta be the other way. They racket up with <laughs> yeah. the ball, and they only go. They only go through it. They only go through it. They never go under it. And you can you can say it ten thousand times. They're just not going to top spin. Mm -hmm. If they watch the bottom of the ball, that's the cue. And then if you tell them take the top of the racket and put it under the bottom of the ball, voila, you've got top spin. Okay. You know, I had a girl uh, just recently went off and played college tennis, but she thought she was going to quit tennis um, because she didn't think she was good enough to play college. And she was mostly hitting way too much top spin on everything and miss hitting an awful lot. And we got her to flatten the ball out. So I asked her to watch the top of the ball and keep your racket up with the ball longer. And now, Boom, now we're getting some good, really good, powerful topspin shots from her. So that's okay. one. So to clarify, if you want to hit more topspin, focus on the bottom of the ball. If you want to hit flatter, focus on the top of the ball. Yes. Okay. Okay, yes. go on. Now, um, now, another thing you can do, because sometimes training gets boring and you've seen, you know, 10,000 balls and you're just getting really tired of playing. And you can play some little games with the ball to keep it interesting. You can pretend like you're riding the ball. So you so imagine yourself, you imagine yourself, here's Lisa, she's on the ball and you hit it and you're flying with it and it's flying back and you're just having fun with that. So that's, I mean, it's kind of weird, but it, it gives you a different appreciation. Mm -hmm. Another one is you can see, do you see the slight bit of shade here? Mm -hmm. It's better in the sunlight. Watch when you're seeing the ball, Watch the watch the difference in how the sun and the shade on the ball. Appear. OK. OK. Um, another thing, this is a good overtraining exercise. Get yourself a little USTA promotional squishy ball. Right. And volley with these. You can volley really well with these overtraining. 
smaller thing. So when you train with a smaller thing, then the regular ball is going to look so big. Yeah. It's going to, it looks like a grapefruit. And I don't know. I've, I've seen some really dramatic things. Five, three minutes of volleying with this and then boom, boom, boom. Just great stuff, right? Another thing is Z balls and Q balls, right? So the Z ball is very aggressive and it jumps crazy and you can train your reflexes and reactions. The Q ball, I don't know if they still make them, but it's a little bit less aggressive. And I like that better because then what it does is it trains you for bad bounces because there isn't a tennis court that's perfectly flat, nor is there a tennis ball that's perfectly round. So the ball is going to bounce funny at times. And sometimes you get somebody and they just barely scrape it and they go, and the ball turn is going to jump, you know, three feet to the left. Right. So your ability to stay with that and work with that ball is, is going to be enhanced by using those, those sort of, um, uh, reflex drills. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, we're at the end of our hour. I'm so sorry, but I really appreciate you doing this. Um, I have put your email address in the first comment. Uh, so for people that want to get a hold of you, your book is in the Parenting Aces shop on Amazon. So if you go amazon.com slash parenting aces, uh, Bill's visual yeah, training for tennis book is there and disclaimer, I might get a couple cents if you buy it that way. Um, but at least that makes it easy for you to find it. Bill, for those that want to sign up for your course, how do they do that? And I'm going to put that in the comments too. You can, it's going to be launching soon. So they okay. can send me an email that they're Perfect. interested and I'll get them on the list and I'll also send them some free stuff. So in exchange awesome. for your email, I will send you an article that goes into a little more depth and also talks about some of the things we didn't have time to get into today. And um, you can also find me on Facebook or Instagram. So on Instagram, right. I'm Bill Patton 720. And I, I post content on Instagram now and then. Okay. And then you get to see my personal life a little bit too. Perfect. Bill Patton, thanks so much for joining us. To our watchers today, our listeners today, thank you so much for tuning in. And hopefully we'll have more live streams for you this week. Uh, for sure, we have Tennis Takeaways with Dewey and Lisa coming on Wednesday morning. So be sure and check that out every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Central. We're all over. But um, Bill Patton, thanks so much for joining us and have a great thank day and a great week. Thank you for the people watching and thank you, Lisa. See ya. Bye-bye.